Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History and al Mukaddima. From the mid-8th to mid-9th century, the Eastern Roman Empire had to contend with the Abbasid Caliphate, situated on its eastern frontier. The Islamic Caliphate was one of the mightiest empires in the world at the time. But they were far less fixated with the elimination of the Eastern Roman Empire than their predecessors, the Umayyads, had been. The relationship between the Abbasid Caliphate and the Eastern Roman Empire was summed up by the 10th century Patriarch of Constantinople, Nicholas I, who wrote, There are two lordships, that of the Saracens and that of the Romans, which stand above all lordships on earth and shine out like the two mighty beacons of the firmament. They ought, for this very reason alone, to be in contact and brotherhood, and not, because we differ in our lives and habits and religion, remain alien in all ways to each other, and deprive themselves of correspondence carried on in writing. This video is a collaboration with al Muqaddimah, who covers Islamic history in detail. He has created a video about society in the Abbasid Caliphate. In that video, which has links in both the description and the pinned comment, he discusses what the experience of living in the Caliphate was like. Once you have watched this video, please go and check it out. To begin the video, al Muqaddimah shall give some background to Byzantine-Abbasid relations with an overview of the wars between their predecessors, the Umayyads, and the Eastern Roman Empire. For most of the 7th century, the Eastern Roman Empire was in a life and death struggle with its eastern neighbours. First the Sassanid Persian Empire and then the Islamic Caliphate. There was hardly a more determined enemy of the Eastern Romans at the time than the governor of Syria, later Caliph, Moabia. While the emperor of the Romans at the time, Constance II, was no military genius, he did manage to keep the Arabs at bay despite almost constant attacks in Armenia, Anatolia, North Africa and at sea. He reformed the empire to cope but his measures and rather blunt style of rule made him very unpopular. The revolt of one of his generals initiated a campaign by the Arabs that eventually took them to the gates of Constantinople and placed it under siege. While the siege was lifted after around a year, the reputation of Constance II did not survive and he was brutally murdered while taking a bath. His son, Constantine IV, took over and after a decade of bloody campaigns, raids and battles, as well as the death of Caliph Moavia in 680 CE, the emperor finally extracted a peace treaty from the new caliph, which lasted from 680 to 692. During this period, the Islamic Caliphate once again descended into a bitter civil war. It was only after the second fitna, as it is known, was over that the Caliph looked for an excuse to resume the jihad against the Romans. This came in the form of a dispute with the new Eastern Roman Emperor, Justinian II. While the son of Constantine IV had had the perspicacity to take advantage of the second fitna to extract more favourable tribute payments, his bold decision to remove most of the population of Cyprus to found a new city invoked the ire of the Caliph. Moreover, Justinian II had been infuriated by the Caliphs who started paying the tribute owed to the Romans in smaller gold dinars rather than larger Roman solidi. The result was war. It was a war that Justinian II did not win and carried on once he had lost his throne to a usurper named Leontius. The jihad resumed with renewed vigour. North Africa was lost, Sicily and Sardinia were raided, Armenia was lost, as was Cilicia. Not only was the Eastern Roman army struggling to cope, but in the space of 22 years, the empire had seven usurpations. Leontius deposed Justinian II, Tiberius III deposed Leontius, Justinian II returned and removed Tiberius III, Justinian was deposed and executed by Philippicus, who was then replaced in less than two years by Anastasius II, who was deposed two years later by Theodosius III, who was himself usurped by Leo III in 717 CE. When Leo became emperor, a huge Arab army and navy had arrived outside Constantinople to besiege it. Leo III, after a year-long siege with the help of his Bulgar allies and Greek fire ships, annihilated the Umayyad invasion force. Only a pathetic remnant returned to Syria. 
Henceforth, the caliphate launched annual punitive raids against Byzantine Anatolia. But even this relentless devastation was ended in 740, when an Eastern Roman army, led by Leo III, won a notable victory over an Umayyad raiding force at the Battle of Akrinon. After this point, for the last years of the Umayyad Caliphate, the Eastern Roman Empire went on the offensive and conducted raids of their own, burning and looting towns, taking slaves, and resettling Christian populations from the Umayyad frontier in Thrace. Back to you, Daniel. The Caliphate and Eastern Roman Empire were generally hostile towards each other, launching raids and counter-raids, as well as punitive expeditions. A frontier was maintained along the Taurus mountain range, as well as in Sicily, Sardinia, and Italy in the west. Naval warfare was also conducted between Saracen pirates and the Roman navy. During times of civil war, rival emperors might call upon the caliph for aid against their rival. This happened in both the Isaurian civil war and the civil war between Michael the Amorian and Thomas the Slav. In 743, when the Caliph Hisham died and was succeeded by Walid II, as Theophanes recounts in his Chronographia, both Constantine and Artabastos sought his alliance by sending an envoy to him. The former sent the Spatharios Andrew, the latter the Logotheti Gregory. Although nothing came of the embassies, it is significant that both rival emperors sought the aid of the Caliph during their struggle. In the civil war between Michael the Stammerer and Thomas the Slav, the Caliphate played a far more active role in the conflict. Genesius described the diplomacy that took place between Thomas and the Caliph. Thomas's army then, which had turned against its countrymen, grew so much that the Saracens seized the opportunity to freely plunder all the islands and lands, and would have conquered them utterly, even though afterwards numerous reports circulated among them which made Thomas seem invincible. Hence he attempted to negotiate with them in the following way. He cunningly enticed them, suggesting that he would be satisfied with whatever they desired, as they greatly feared his large force. He therefore sent an embassy to them, seeking peace, which was in reality an alliance whose purpose was to overthrow the emperor. Having thus made a treaty with the Agarenoi, with the concurrence of their leader, he was crowned emperor by the patriarch Job of Antioch. He assembled his famous army, which was composed of Agarenoi, Indians, Egyptians, Assyrians, Medes, Abascians, Zikians, Iberians, Gabarians, Slavs, Huns, Vandals, Gitai, and all those who had partaken of the abomination of Mani, as well as Lazoi, Alans, Chaldeans, Armenians, and other peoples of all sorts, and he took control of the entire east. Finally, he marched the Thrace and tried to take Byzantium by force by laying siege to it, placing his hopes in his heavy cavalry, infantry, rock throwers, slingers, and countless peltists. The list of peoples in Thomas's forces should not deceive the reader into thinking that his army was purely composed of foreigners, most of which were given classical names such as Huns and Medes. Most of Thomas's army consisted of the empire's thematic soldiers in Anatolia, but does show that the caliph was able to send him a wide array of people from different races from his caliphate. Perhaps the most interesting fact is that the caliph permitted Thomas to be crowned by the Patriarch of Antioch. Although an inferior patriarchate to the one in Constantinople, it constituted the legitimization of this usurper. It is not explicit what the caliph hoped to gain by his alliance with Thomas. At the very least, it secured his frontier with the Romans. A diplomatic mission was a good opportunity to display the power of the Byzantine Emperor to his eastern rival. A diplomat could serve as a spy on their rival's court and see what developments had occurred there. The mission of Patriarch John the Grammarian to Caliph al Mamun in AD 830 provides a detailed account of what these embassies entailed. John the Grammarian was a well educated, intelligent, and trustworthy man, and the tutor of Emperor Theophilus. 
He had with him many gifts to hand to both the caliph and his subjects to display the majesty of the Eastern Roman Empire. The caliph did the same and presented John with many presents, which John rejected. The caliph offered to release a hundred prisoners of war, but the patriarch refused the offer. John insisted that the caliph and the emperor Theophilus should exchange an equal number of prisoners to each other. The caliph agreed. A diplomatic mission was also a chance for the caliph to show off just as much as it was for the emperor. He befriended John and through his hospitality showed the patriarch his treasury, palaces and frequently visited him in his home. When John returned to Constantinople, he urged Theophilus to build a palace in the style of Arabian architecture. The Byres Palace was built soon afterwards as a result. The Caliph sent embassies to Constantinople for a number of reasons as well. Caliphs sent letters trying to convert the Emperor to Islam. Caliph Harun al-Rashid sent such an embassy. While they were never successful, it demonstrates the Caliphate's desire to spread their faith by both pen and sword. Often, during their own civil wars, the Caliphs needed to forge a peace treaty with the Romans to secure their flank. The cultural output of the Eastern Roman Empire had greatly diminished during the 7th century. By 717, the Patriarch Nicephorus commented on how learning and education had reached a dire state of affairs. The University of Constantinople that had been opened by Theodosius II was closed and was not reopened until the reign of Theophilus. The decline of culture, including art, knowledge, education, literature and architecture, was linked to the rest of the fortunes of the empire. An empire beset on all sides with a largely rural society had little need for commentaries on Aristotle or a mastery of Attic Greek. Basic literacy and numeracy was still taught because many people were needed to fill the roles in the church and bureaucracy. But survival was the watchword of the empire in the 7th and early 8th centuries. Several factors initiated the cultural revival of the Eastern Roman Empire in the late 8th and 9th century. The Abbasid Caliphate and iconoclasm were two essential factors. The shock of losing two-thirds of their empire and the near loss of their capital convinced the Romans that they had lost the favour of God. It is perhaps no coincidence that at roughly the same time that the Caliphate adopted an aniconic approach to religious art with the iconoclast Edict of Yazid II in AD 721, Leo III adopted a similar position for his government in AD 726. In combination with constant Arab attacks and a volcanic eruption that year, the iconoclast controversy that followed was a religious dispute in the Orthodox Church over whether it was correct to depict holy beings on icons. Church councils were held to support and denounce iconoclasm. The need to be able to read texts and write argumentations resulted in a natural improvement in the quality of learning people received by the end of the 8th century. The failure of the iconophile emperors from 780 to 813 resulted in the iconoclast debate being revived and another round of religious debate and persecution occurred. Ironically, the Abbasids' successes during the reign of Theophilus did more than anything to disabuse the Eastern Romans of the righteousness of iconoclasm. After the triumph of orthodoxy in AD 843, iconoclasm never returned. The Abbasids patronised the translation and study of numerous texts from the territories they had conquered. Ancient Greek philosophy, medicine, science, and other works were translated into Arabic. One notable anecdote from the period says that when Caliph al-Mamun heard of the Roman polymath, Leo the mathematician, he asked him to come to Baghdad to teach and study there. Leo reported the request to the government. He was summoned to Constantinople by the Emperor Theophilus, who gave him a large sum of money and employed him as a teacher. 
re-establishing the University of Constantinople in the process. Afterwards, Al-Mamun consulted Leo on many subjects, such as geometry, which he solved for him. The caliph eventually sent the emperor a request to send Leo to the caliphate in exchange for a peace treaty and 144,000 gold solidi. Theophilus refused. While none of Leo the mathematician's work survive, he is known to have created a system of watchtowers and signals that could relate the news of an Arab attack back to Constantinople within a few hours. A similar system was still in place in the themes in the 10th century to warn their headquarters of attack. In the 9th century, the Romans confronted Islam and its theology. The Quran was translated into Greek, and Nicetas of Byzantium was the first Eastern Roman to write a refutation of the Quran. Before him, Syriac Christians such as John of Damascus have been the main champions of Christian theology against that of Islam. One example of the content of Nicetas's refutation, which used citations of the Greek translation of the Quran throughout his work, decried Islam for sanctioning murder on God's behalf, which of course relates to the pious nature of jihad. The translation was not perfect, with the Islamic title of God being translated as Samad, which means eternal and solid, but Nikitas showed both a good knowledge of the Quran and the first real attempts to counter its theology. By 863, the Byzantines had developed their sophisticated culture and supported a host of intellectuals, leading to their cultural golden age, known as the Macedonian Renaissance. In the 9th century, trade increased between the Romans and Caliphate. By the end of the 9th century, Arab traders set up trading posts and bought houses in Constantinople. The Arabs brought goods from the Caliphate as well as fashions and news to the marketplaces of Constantinople. Conversely, the Romans did not establish similar trade posts in the Caliphate. However, the Romans conducted business all across the Mediterranean Sea and beyond. The success of this trade attracted pirates, and throughout the 9th and early 10th centuries, the navies of the Byzantines and Abbasids attacked each other for loot and slaves. Notably, the island of Crete fell to a pirate navy of Moorish refugees from Spain, and turned the island into a base for naval raids. For their part, in AD 853, an Eastern Roman fleet sacked Alexandria in Egypt. Trade between the Caliphate and Byzantine Empire had already been established before the time of the Abbasids. The Emperor Leo III had introduced a silver coin called a miliaresion, the design of which was similar to the Arabian dirham. The miliaresion helped make it easier for the Byzantines to do business with the Caliphate and their spheres of influence, since they did not previously have a silver coin in circulation. In the Caliphate and elsewhere in the Islamic world, all non-Muslim subjects lived under a status called dhimmi. When the Islamic Caliphate conquered parts of the Eastern Roman Empire, Sassanid Empire and beyond, a cornucopia of peoples and creeds were brought under their sway. Coptic Christians, Zoroastrian Persians, Armenians, Aramaeans, Jews, other Arabian tribes and many more. Issued by the Caliph Umar I, he instituted a pact that established the relationship between the Muslim Arabs and their non-Muslim subjects. Although no versions of the pact are the same, as it has been used and altered over the centuries, the Pact of Umar established the notion of a dima, a protected person in an Islamic society. A dhimmi had to pay a head tax in return for protection called jizya, and was exempted from military service. Dhimmis also had to follow certain laws prescribed against them. One such law from a 9th century pact stated that we will honour the Muslims and rise up in our assemblies when they wish to take their seats, that we will not imitate them in our dress, either in the cap, turban, sandals, or parting of the hair, that we will not make use of their expressions of speech, nor adopt their surnames. 
Romans that defected to the caliphate might consider converting to Islam to avoid these restrictions. The long-standing warfare between the caliphate and the Eastern Roman Empire meant that many prisoners of war were taken by both sides. In 781, Caliph Harun al-Rashid captured and executed 2,090 prisoners taken when he invaded the empire. The mass execution of prisoners by both sides could be for symbolic and practical reasons. Emperor Theophilus blinded and mutilated the prisoners he took during his campaign against Melitini and Sozopetra to strike terror into the Arabs. When the Arabs sacked Amorium in 838, they massacred their prisoners in retribution. Byzantine military manuals discouraged the taking of prisoners and emphasised that winning a battle was more important than whether they could ransack the enemy's baggage train afterwards. Military manuals prescribed the execution of prisoners to maintain an army's manoeuvrability. In 879, Basil I executed his prisoners because he lacked the soldiers to guard them. When the caliph or emperor broke an agreement, it was often answered with the execution of prisoners of war. Leo VI, in his Tactica, a military textbook, encouraged keeping prisoners alive, at least until the end of a war for several reasons. Some could be recruited as spies or Byzantine soldiers. Prisoners could also be used to pay for the return of Roman captives in the caliphate. However, the prisoners that the Byzantines took for the long term were generally treated well enough for captives. They were kept in the Praetorium, the main prison of Constantinople. Arab prisoners were allowed to visit the mosque in the capital to pray. In fact, Constantine VII explained the history of the mosque in Constantinople in his De Administrando Imperio. Marcellamus made an expedition against Constantinople, and at whose request was built the mosque of the Saracens in the imperial praetorium. One form of charity for pious Romans was to provide prisoners with food and water. Captives were allowed to conduct business among their fellow prisoners and earn money. However, prison was still prison. The Arabs lived in stone cells, spent a portion of their time performing exhausting and pointless tasks, and were not allowed to change clothes. The most common fate for prisoners on both sides was to be sold into slavery. When towns and villages were attacked, the taking of slaves was an important form of loot. Slaves were as valuable as finding treasures or supplies. While some prisoners were needed for exchanges or ransom, the rest were often sold for great profit. Those prisoners that were neither sold nor ransomed were typically forcefully converted to Christianity and settled on Byzantine territory. Those that refused could be severely punished. The Arabs would sometimes compel their Christian subjects, such as the Patriarch of Antioch, to travel to Constantinople to alleviate the punishment meted out to Arab prisoners of war. However, integrating into Byzantine society could be an attractive prospect for an Arab prisoner. In the 10th century, Constantine the Seventh explained how an Arab prisoner was integrated into a theme, and why the prospect was attractive to them. Take note that they must, each one of them, receive three nomismata from the protonotarius of the theme, six nomismata for their yoke of oxen, and fifty-four modii of grain for their seed and provisions. Note that concerning captives given as son-in-law to households, whether the household which the Saracen's son-in-law enters is military or civil, it is exempted for three years from the land tax and the hearth tax. After three years, this household is obliged once more to pay the land tax and the hearth tax. Note that when the captives or others are given land for settlement, they remain free from all service to the fisc for three years, and they pay neither the hearth tax nor the land tax.
six. After the completion of the three years, they pay both the land tax and the half tax. Some Arabs would defect to the Byzantines because it was thought that the Eastern Roman Empire offered prosperity and a better life than their lot in the Caliphate. The price was conversion to Christianity. This may have been why groups such as the Kuramites migrated in such great numbers to the Eastern Roman Empire rather than anywhere else during the 9th century. As one can see, the relationship between the Abbasid Caliphate and Eastern Roman Empire during the 8th and 9th centuries was a very complex one, and concerned emperors and common people alike. This video was made in collaboration with al Mukaddimah. He kindly created the segment about the Byzantine Umayyad Wars. I have created a segment in his video. Between our two videos, we hope the relationship between the two empires and what life was like at the time has been made much clearer. Please find a link to his channel and our other video in the description below. And this has been Al Mukaddimah and Eastern Roman History. Thank <laughs> you.